God bless. This is Father Mika Yul, Father Michael, uh, with another uh, live episode of Living Orthodox. And today I'm joined by a, a very special guest, someone who uh, you know I've, I've had an opportunity to speak to before, uh, Kyle, and uh, also known as Orthodox Kyle. So <laughs> better better than than not being Orthodox. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here with us today, Kyle. Thank you. I think it's going to be a great conversation. I hope everyone's having a great Lent. Yeah, it's a, a blessed struggle uh, to everyone. It's uh, yeah. Lent is kind of like the spring cleaning for the soul, as uh, Father Vladimir would always tell me back at Christ the Savior. He, he said it's like spring cleaning for the soul. You know, you get all the other external stuff out of the way, and it becomes a lot easier for you to deal with other things. So, yeah, yeah it's uh, it's quite uh, it's, it's quite a wondrous time. So. Today, Kyle is joining us to talk about, uh, of course, uh, becoming Orthodox, uh, different things that we can uh, we can read with regards to to strengthening ourselves, especially with re uh, with regards to doing apologetics. Um, but you know, first, uh, without further ado, I'd like to to get Kyle to introduce himself. Although I think everyone here is familiar with you, <laughs> I would love to and and with your work, which is greatly appreciated and needed, I would say. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Kyle, and, and your, your journey into the Orthodox Church and, and what uh, really prompted that and, uh, mm -hmm. and how it's gone so far? Yeah. So, Kyle, my name's Kyle. I run a channel called Kyle Orthodox. I also have a channel called The Orthocast where I interview different people and I learn about their upbringing and how they found Orthodox Christianity. And then we normally talk about some uh, other topics. I've had uh, Father Michael on and we have his story on that channel. So definitely go check that out. I also run Dyer Clips, you know, watching lots of Jay Dyer content. And so making that into more digestible uh, content on the Dyer Clips channel. And then my main channel, you know, Kyle Orthodox, where I mainly do apologetics and I try and highlight other people in the Orthodox sphere responding to lots of common atheist arguments, Catholic arguments, Protestant arguments, Muslim arguments. I mean, everyone who kind of, you know, sets themselves up against the, you know, the kingdom of God. So, um, yeah, that's basically, uh, what I do and how I found orthodoxy was, I mean, it's a, it's a long story. I wasn't raised with any religion eventually because of kind of being disenfranchised with the world eventually found, you know, Christ. And I thought it was just like Protestant versus Catholic became Catholic, started to get really into that and watching a lot of you know, Catholics online and seeing everyone was talking about like traditional Catholicism and the Latin mass. And so it was actually just at my local Novus Ordo parish um, where I started to meet more traditional minded Catholics and getting invited into Latin mass and being like, wow, this, this is amazing. Like it's just uh, a way more reverent and way more traditional uh, form of Catholicism, um, kind of keeping on to the traditions before the changes of Vatican II. And so this kind of led me on a journey of learning more about like why were all these there are all these changes <clears throat> in the Catholic world, and then also in that journey learning about Eastern Catholicism and going to a Melkite Divine Liturgy, and kind of getting a lot into you know SSPX, and um, which is a specific kind of uh, branch of traditional Catholicism, and then I started to see more and more the contradictions of the Catholic system, seeing that. You know, the Catholic Church is supposed to be basically preserve Christianity in its fullest. But how could they mess up on these fundamental things like the liturgy, like how we worship God? And um, especially when we read in the Old Testament that that's 
so important. And so luckily, I mean, well, by the grace of God, not luck, you know, Providence at this time, I came across uh, Jay Dyer's channel uh, kind, kind of randomly um, because uh, I actually used to have this other YouTube channel called Christian Simplicity. And someone subscribed to me and they just happened to be subscribed to Jay. I'm like, what is this channel? So I like click on that. You know, mm -hmm. it was at this time where I was just really confused where there wasn't answers in the Catholic world of all these contradictions. And so I started to watch a lot of Jay's content, especially on Catholicism. And I saw that, you know, Vatican One is a huge innovation and it's it's not in the first millennium that we can see the canons in the first millennium uh, disprove Vatican One. And also um, a lot of the work of Ubi Petrus, who focuses, he was also ex-Catholic who became Orthodox and talking about the forgeries and how all these, you know, really academic refutation of these like Catholic common Catholic arguments that we hear, like things about like <coughs> Matthew 16 and oh, Orthodox allow, you know, divorce and remarriage, like going into extreme death about, about these issues. And I saw that, that Orthodoxy, you know, was, it, was the truth. And even if Catholicism was true, it like, wasn't that big a deal to be Orthodox. So that next step was actually just like going to an Orthodox church. And, you know, as soon as I went, it's like, this is so amazing. Just going, even in the Vesper services, like just feeling the presence of God. And the more and more I, I went, I felt like Orthodoxy is just so much deeper. Like I really didn't know Christian, like what the purest form of Christianity was until, you know, I, I was Orthodox. And I mean, even to this day, I learned more and more about the Orthodox faith. And it, it just, it sets itself so different than anything else out there. And so um, now I just, I, because of this re all this research that I've done, um, I've tried to, and like seeing all the bad arguments out there and like wanting to, to help people, I uh, post a lot of content responding to these various different groups um, of, you know, why Christianity is a truth, why, you know, orthodoxy is the religion of the apostles and sharing that with others, encouraging other people to go to church because, you know, orthodoxy isn't something we should just be doing at home. Like the best thing you can do is just go to your local church and, you know, talk, talk to your priest and, you know, get involved. I think you're going to meet like-minded people. You're going to have a really, really great community. And it's, uh, it's so great to see all these people like <laughs> reaching out to me and saying you know, how grateful they are that they have like the Orthodox faith in, in their life now. Cause it's just like, you know, religion isn't just something you can be lukewarm about. It's something that you're devoting your life to. So you just want something very like solid and serious and, and, and unchanging and, and truthful. And like having that, you know, true relationship with Christ through the sacraments through, you know, reading the lives of the saints, you're only going to get that, you know, that pure Christianity um, in the Orthodox church. Very true. Yeah. Very true. It's uh, it's, it's one of those things that when, when you kind of discover it for the first time, you're kind of wondering <laughs> why, why didn't I find this sooner? You know? Yeah, I exactly. Thought, yeah. It was the case for me. Right. I mean, I, I thought, oh, you know, compared to everything else, it, you know, and I don't mean it to be, I'm not trying to be funny or, or, unfair when I say this, but, uh, you know, everything else just was kind of lame after a while, right? It was, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I remember going to the Catholic church, especially, and uh, being really uncomfortable realizing that there were lay people, lay women, you know, lay men, Susan from the parish council, you know, <laughs> yeah. out, uh, you know, what we believe to be the body and blood of Christ there. Yeah. And, and I thought, well, if this is the case, you know, like this is a complete unveiling of the holy things. It kind of reminds me, of the the communist revolution right where they yeah. had the unveiling of the of the saints as they called it where they would dig up the graves of the saints and desecrate their bodies uh just to try to uh disprove god to say oh look how normal this all is and and to try yeah. to demystify um so it's uh it's very it, it's it's very sad when we see that happen because it can it can shake the faith of a lot of people and you know mm -hmm. we don't want to shatter the faith of people who are looking into the church from the outside but uh, that, that kind of happens inevitably in some ways, it would seem. Yeah, definitely. So, so Kyle, um, with your journey to orthodoxy, what were some things you found uh, most useful uh, in terms of bringing you into the church? What was it that really stood out to you the most? So what stood out to me the <laughs> most was that, you know, online we are getting these very detailed like answers, like any question I have, I was able to find that online. 
But then taking it to the next step is like going to the parish. They were completely in sync. Like it wasn't like I was hearing something online and then I was going into the parish and then orthodoxy was just com something completely different. Actually, orthodoxy in many ways is much more rich like in person because you're actually, you know, in the in the divine liturgy, you're you know, you're feeling this holiness. You know, a lot of churches will are, um they have they have relics in them. I mean, every altar should have a relic of a saint in it. So it's like going to a church, you can just feel that that holiness. Um yeah. but yeah, just the amazing resources online and then you know going to the parish and like finding that that um same thing. Yeah, no, and and that's the thing. And a fun fun fact, not only is there a relic of a saint in the altar, a lot of the time there's also one in the anti mints, which is the the special cloth that we have on the altar that the priest unfolds uh, after the gospel reading during the uh, the litany of fervent supplication that always has to have uh, either one uh, the relic of a saint or multiple saints. Um, at uh, at Christ the Savior, we had um, uh, more than one saint's uh, relics that were stitched into the the anti -mitten. So it's this very beautiful thing that goes back to really the, the time of the apostles, right? Where in Revelations, we see the saints crying out from underneath the altar for, for their blood that had been spilled upon the earth. And this is also why we celebrate the liturgy on uh, the relics of, of martyrs and saints. So it, it's really neat to see that, uh, that kind of continuity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Kyle, what, what is, uh, what got you into wanting to do the, the online apologetics? What, what was it that kind of sparked so, that? Uh... <laughs> so because I was watching like all this, you know, orthodox content and I had always really been into apologetics coming from an atheistic background, you just have a lot of questions. And I remember seeing when I, when I didn't know all the differences, I was watching all these like random channels like uh, Frank Turek and Wretched and all, all these channels. I was always interested in just like, you know, how do, how do we defend the faith? Because I saw the like goodness, truth and like beauty to Christianity. So it's like, okay, well, how do we, how do we defend this? And how, how can I make a convincing argument to other people <laughs> that the faith isn't unre uh, unreasonable? So even when I wasn't Orthodox, I was always interested in that, but I always felt like the arguments weren't, the best like they, they 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 could be better and so when i got into orthodoxy hearing people like uh jay dyer and father deacon and Anias and david erhan seeing how they approach these you know the, like the transcendental argument of god and watching a lot of their atheist debate reviews i realized that there's like a entirely better way to approach apologetics with like presuppositional apologetics like you shouldn't grant your opponent anything you should get to like the root of their belief. And so seeing this, um, I used to have like a work, I was having a work from home job and watching a lot of a lot, a lot of these, um, these streams when I was uh, like looking into orthodoxy. And naturally, I just kind of like soaked a lot of it in just watching hours of this hours of apologetics of not only like against atheism. Um, you know, I obviously I was really interested in the Catholicism issue, because it's a really big deal to leave the Catholic Church. So I wanted to make sure I had a lot of research uh, before leaving. <laughs> I can um, relate. <laughs> yeah. And then, so because I had all this like knowledge on this, um, I, well, actually what first happened, my, the first video on my channel is why I left Catholicism for Orthodoxy, which is just a compilation of all of my research that I compiled during that period because I wanted to explain to my Catholic friends, like why I'm leaving the Catholic church. And why I'm becoming Orthodox because it wasn't something I like wanted to do. It's like it was really difficult to um, coming from a secular background to kind of like leave all. Like I grew apart from all my secular friends, and then I finally found these Catholic people that I agree with so much. And then it's just like I see all the problems in, in the faith, and it's just like really like would like how do I explain it to them? Especially a lot since a lot of them were like raised in these traditional Catholic families, and like so I made this presentation. And I kept presenting it because I wanted to um, practice for when I showed it to all my friends. And I'm like, well, might as well just record it. So um, I ended up recording it, the, the, best, the best version after practicing it a few times. I uploaded it to YouTube and I, I had prior experience with YouTube because of my channel, Christian Simplicity. Um, so yeah, I uploaded that and I'm like, 
well, might as well just share it with Jay. So I, I sent it to him and then he ended up sharing it. I'm like, wow, that's, that's cool. And I ended up getting a lot of views. And um, there were some other things I like wanted to talk about on my Christian Simplicity channel that weren't exactly in that niche because that niche was more like minimalism, which is more like lifestyle uh -huh. and Christianity. So I started talking about some other things. Like I made a follow-up video which is like the other half of my presentation of why um, Catholics should become Orthodox. And then I reported on some like other things that I was seeing. And then I started seeing that React videos were like really easy to make and that it was getting lots of views. I'm like, this is kind of like silly. Like <coughs> Re React videos require so little effort and mm -hmm. they get so many views. And I was seeing that a lot of these like atheist videos, like I like see, I like, I enjoyed watching people respond to like atheist videos because I'm like, oh, that atheist made kind of a good point. And so I'm like, well, watching these atheist videos, I'm like, well, I can respond to that. This is literally like terrible arguments. Like you don't even need anything <laughs> that sophisticated to respond to it. So that's how I started. It's just like this, these arguments aren't that good. Um, yeah, and, and I think when someone challenges them and, and kind of reacts in a more direct way to them like that, it kind of, it, it's almost like you can see a conversation happening between the two sides. It might kind of mm -hmm. open up a bit of a dialectic for the person watching, right? And yeah. so it, it can kind of make them start going, oh, right, why didn't I ever question this? Yeah. And then, yeah, exactly. And then I was, I also wanted to respond to like a lot of Catholics because I felt like, you know, I did all the, you know, the research <laughs> and like all the pop Catholic apologists just did not have very good arguments at all. So it's like, I should respond to this. And I do have some regrets when I first started my channel is that I was maybe, I was like kind of like too, I sounded too mad or like too kind of, <laughs> kind of like angry. Like I think maybe definitely- Maybe too convicted. <laughs> yeah, too convicted and maybe like, <coughs> definitely like, you know, reading the Orthodox saints, like being more calm and like, you know, thinking about like you want to convince them if they're watching this video, you don't want to like, just, you know, you don't, you don't want to be bitter in, in your responses, but uh, yeah. So I basically, I just started responding to a lot of these videos where I'm like, these aren't very, like very good arguments, mainly just like atheists and Catholics. And I always made sure because I was kind of scared if I like accidentally taught something wrong. So what I would do and I would, I think every Orthodox person should do is like, look, like don't rely on yourself, rely on, what you read from like a saint, what you read from, what you heard from your priest, what you heard from someone who's like a trusted source instead of like, because when you're like speculating about, um, you know, like this certain theology, especially when you're new, it's very easy to mess up and you don't want to like publicly teach heresy. Like, so looking to other people and kind of repeat like the truth that the, the church fathers is, is just like repeating these like time, these timeless truths. So that's what I tried to do in my videos is uh, just respond to a lot of these. I'm just like, these aren't good. These aren't good arguments. And I think it will be helpful to people if I, I respond to this. And it was when I had a lot, I had a, like so much time because I was um, I was in my like last semester of college and I didn't have that many classes. So I'm like, I basically just got to focus on YouTube uh, full time. And I just was able to just make so many videos. I mean, some of those videos I, I still like need to upload. And that's why, you know, if you watch, if you watch my videos, some videos, I have a beard, some videos I don't, it's because I like filmed it. So, so, so it's not that it, you just grow a beard really, really fast. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but, um, yeah. So that's how my channel started is just making a lot of those react videos and also, uh, people would just comment, like they would give me videos to react to. Um, and I, st and then another one of my first videos was like Protestantism because, you know, I was never really convinced by Protestantism, but I thought it'd be good to like show why, like I was never convinced. So I made a pro video Protestantism debunked in 15 minutes, which actually did like incredibly well. Um, but yeah, so just kind of riding that wave of, you know, I've, I've watched all I've list, I've soaked all this in by watching so much apologetics. And I think I can do something that can like help other people. And mm. um, so it's it's been really good. And I have so many great videos planned. And I think it's going to be, you know, all this, this entire Orthodox sphere is, is, uh, is growing together, which is great. Like I remember 
another video I made was, uh, you know, best Orthodox Christian YouTube channels to kind of like highlight, hey, these are the people you should watch. Um, mm -hmm. But I remember like getting your comment because, you know, you you just started your YouTube channel. But it's just been it's, it's been cool to see like all these channels grow together, like seeing your channel grow and, and have, have some viral videos. So I think uh, I'm very optimistic about the future of orthodoxy and and online orthodoxy. I think it's getting better and more refined with time. I think so, too. And, and it, it's one of those things where it, it's always going to be a bit like navigating a minefield. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's it's always going to be a little bit difficult you will inevitably meet a lot of resistance there's always a lot of temptation yeah. um and and of course you know sometimes tone doesn't always get conveyed the way that you hope it does and a lot of the time especially for for us uh more slavic priests <laughs> because i i am of uh, of russian descent but uh we we tend to be very to the point and sometimes that can be really difficult uh yeah to sell to people in north america in other words, it can be really difficult for them to kind of understand where you're coming from when you're being direct and just cut into the chase. So what are what are some things that you found have been um, both obstacles and kind of helpful for you in um, uh, in being able to uh, to reach to people and some of maybe the, the opposition that you faced? You know, what, what has been kind of a way you've had to navigate around that? Yeah. So, I mean, me personally. <clears throat> my approach at the beginning definitely wasn't the most mature. And so kind of refining that over time and finding, you know, like the proper, proper use of memes. It's like, yeah, you're totally right about like being direct. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, finding the balance of being direct and being truthful with someone, but not like, not trying to be like overly rude about it has been um, like, we could, we can all let pride blind us so it's like when you have the truth and you're really excited about it it's easy to to fall in, into that i mean that's where like the devil gets us so making sure that we like you know have have the the orthodox spirit when we're talking about it online and, and we also have to keep in mind that a lot of people it's not necessarily it's not a logical argument like why they're not christian or why they're not orthodox it's probably an emotional reason. Like most, like most people kind of live, live based off emotion. So you can have all the logical arguments, but you just need to keep in mind, like who you're talking to. Um, like if, if it's a friend or family member, um, just like, are they emotionally mature person? Are they interested in these type of, are they very sensitive? Are they yeah. stubborn? Exactly. Usually with stubborn people, you don't want to force it. You want exactly. to, exactly. You want to be gentle, and and a lot of it, I think, is is exemplifying things. You can't, of course, give quarter um, for certain things. You can't, uh, you know, you can't allow for for certain arguments to kind of escape, right? Like when, uh, you know, I've had family and friends who've fallen into a bit of syncretism at times, or, yeah. or some very strange beliefs, and you, you have to put your foot down and say, well, the, we we can't agree on that, but you know, you, you have to still make it clear that you love the the, the person that's in front of you. Yeah, and that can be that can be challenging for them to see it and, and and to remember that in the heat of the moment. So it's it's one of those things where I think we have to to have a very solid prayer life when we're engaging in any kind of apologetics, be it in, in our personal lives or online. We have to we have to maintain some stability in the, in our prayer, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So and and in terms uh, for you, um, is there some books you'd like to recommend maybe for for some of our people <laughs> to, to get? Yes. Uh, into this to get their heads into the game and and uh, then we can talk about some other things like maybe prayer books and you know good good uh, you know prayer books maybe that are accessible for for some people out there that might struggle with with certain resources like this so we'll, we'll talk about that too yes definitely and before i go into the books my uh, my godmother actually gave me this book and i read the first page of it and i thought it had this amazing quote on conversion it says it's not the evangelical idea of a large number of missionaries fanning out across Asia or Africa and giving everyone a Bible. That's not how Christianity grows over time. It grows through enculturation, through marriage, and through kings. There is a mindset that says something like, go to other religions and replace. The orthodox idea is to integrate, to take what is already present as good and real, and to make it full. <clears throat> and well reading, reading about the history of how orthodoxy is converted, uh, you know, being brought to nations and, you know, we're talking about North America, you know, 
orthodoxy was first brought by St. Innocent and St. And St. Herman in Alaska and like seeing how they uh, conversed with the, the Aleut people is, is very interesting. I think everyone should read those stories if you're interested about like the history of Orthodox evangelization and also reading about people like Cyril and Methodius and like, you know, the apostles to the Slavs and just seeing what was their approach to bringing the, the faith, the faith to people. And that can, um, that can set the tone for how, how we talk with other, other people. But yeah, I, I would say St. Saint, Saints, uh, Kirill and, Meth and Methodi uh, Methodius are very important saints to read the life of if no one here has read them, uh, yeah. be sure to look them up. They're very integral to, uh, anyone in a, in a Slavic Orthodox tradition, especially we, we have a, a special, uh, Kind of place of honor for them in our hearts. It was actually the first liturgy I ever served was on the feast day of Saints Kirill and Methodius. So it's uh, wow. they're, they're special to me too. It's especially because I was so scared that day, <laughs> <laughs> wow. sweating and shaking as you know, thy own of thy own. My hands were just the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so on on the books that I would recommend. Well, first of all, I would recommend. You know, if you're looking to get more involved at your church, I think a great idea is something like a book club because it helps to mm -hmm. read book read books together. Your priest will be mm -hmm. happy. You know, you can in involve him. Like so, you know, creating little things like that at your local church. But first of all, this is the book I have by far recommended the most is Rock and Sand by Father Josiah Trenum. It goes through each of the Protestant reformers and and goes through what they got wrong, and it's. It's a very like academic and good text, but it's also very easy to read. I mean, the the, page, the the words are big. There's like pictures and footnotes, and you know, Father Josiah Trenum, he's an ex Presbyterian, I believe, and I think it's yes. this is definitely one of the best books if you want to understand if you're Protestant looking into Orthodoxy, if you're Orthodox wanting to understand Protestants, um, this book is going to give you a very good, um, very good understanding of, of the Protestant landscape and understanding the Protestant landscape also helps you understand um, Amer America more because America was founded on um, Protestantism. Um, good point. Yeah. And it's and, also a very engaging book. Father Josiah is actually a very, very good author. So yeah, he is. And I believe that it's also in lecture form on YouTube, or at least he has a few lectures on it. Cause I know the book, it sometimes is sold out. Um, and so the next book I re would recommend is Two Paths by um, by uh, Michael Weldon. It's uh, basically this, he, Michael Weldon was Catholic, looking at the two paths, Orthodoxy and Catholicism, um, and seeing the contradictions in the, in the first millennium, um, you know, the different chapters, it covers things like the forgeries, like how people, infallibility, all these ideas. And it's uh, kind of evolved over time and weren't really found in the first millennium. Um, talking about the big contradictions between, you know, Vatican I in the first millennium, the pre and post Vatican II church, basically Vatican II um, modernized the Catholic church a lot and changed a lot of their long established dogmas. And it's it's not that it's not that long. Um, mm -hmm. And I believe Father Michael, you said that they actually read this in uh, Jordanville at the yeah. So in the in the distance program for Jordanville Seminary, uh, Holy Trinity Orthodox Seminary, that that was actually one of the books that our, our professor had us read was uh, Two Paths. Uh, it was I believe it was in, in either the first or second week of the course, and uh, for our comparative theology, which is essentially just a, a course that helps you prepare to engage in the apologetics that you're naturally going to engage in as a priest. Yeah. And uh, so it's it's a integral book in my opinion. I, I think it's a it's a solid recommendation. I really yeah, I'm glad to see yeah. that one there. <laughs> yeah, and then one of the best overall books that covers really all of these issues uh, is the Religion of the Apostles. Um, it's a by, really good one, actually. Yeah, it's uh, by Stephen D. Young, but it it it's really amazing because if you read it, not only does it kind of show the problems with Protestant worship with uh, rabbinical Judaism and Islam, because we can see that, you know, Christianity is the same religion of the apostles. It's the religion of Jesus, the way we worship the Old Testament theophanies talking about the angel of the Lord that, you know, the Trinity was all, always present. Um, like this is just an overall amazing book going through the theology of the apostles, like 
even even before and in the liturgy and like how we worship so amazing book fantastic yeah and then we just had the second sunday of great lent uh, my patron saint saint gregory of palamas um, this is i think everyone should read if you're looking into orthodoxy if you're already orthodox we hear a lot about saint gregory of palamas like hesychasm and essence energy distinction but i recommend that everyone read his sermons <clears throat> not only just for the the theology of it because he does a very good job of talking about orthodox theology and making it very digestible but it also is just very powerful about like what the point of you know christian life is is you know he's he's a monk he's a he's a very holy man and again it's a very short book so um overall i think these books will enrich your faith and give you a better understanding of what we're going to um what we're seeing the most of it which is a lot of like catholicism and, and protestantism um Absolutely. that we're trying to share orthodoxy with so, so i think those books will help a lot and in honor of saint gregory palamas and that book as well the uh, to plug my good friends at uncut mountain press uh yeah. the apodictic treaties on the procession of the holy spirit is another really good one especially if you want to understand the orthodox response to the filioque which actually has worked its way into most protestant sects as well they a lot of them accept the filioque so it, it's a really uh, the understanding the procession of the holy spirit the homilies that that kyle shared um definitely definitely solid books you can't can't go wrong reading uh saint gregory palamas i think there's at jordanville i couldn't afford it at the time when i went uh to the monastery when i got ordained but they also had this big like uh, i think for it was like almost 100 us it was this big wow. book of his homilies by mount tabor uh publications wow massive <laughs> and and he has That's a awesome. ton of homilies on the mother of god as well so yeah. you know maybe wow. if you can find a, a homily on the mother of god by saint gregory Palamas, <laughs> read it before annunciation because that's coming up so yeah yeah totally. it's coming up this weekend glory yeah. to god mm -hmm. so <clears throat> uh, another question i want to, to to ask you kyle is what do you think is needed to bring more people into the orthodox church in particular what do you think would really or what does really appeal to young people about orthodoxy and what has worked in, in your experience and what you've maybe noticed in your end of things to, to help draw people closer to christ yeah i i mean i think the biggest thing is obviously it all starts at the individual level that we are taking our faith seriously so we can be a good example to others and they can feel you know this peace around us you know as saint seraphim of seraph says you know acquire a peaceful spirit and you know, <coughs> thousands around you will be saved so first of all you know not everyone is going to have like a youtube channel um so like at the individual level like you can be the example to your friends and family of like how orthodox christian um sh should live and like you can talk about like you don't need to be like an evangelical that's like always talking about it but just like how you live your life and like sharing positive things about the church you can be an, an evangelist um i know many people who were just you know they were just so excited um, <clears throat> about their faith that they just they shared it positively with their friends not to just say oh you're like you're wrong and you know this is why you need to be orthodox but just like hey i'm really excited i'm like looking into orthodox christianity and all of this like you know I, I would love if you came to church sometime um i mean one of my my close friends he invited his friend and then his friend invited his mom and now they're like gonna go on a trip to to serbia and like all of this like to visit all these monasteries and it's just because he was a he was a good he was a good friend um and what I what I find is that um, when people learn about orthodoxy, like the vast majority of them, like the, when they actually go to church and they hear the arguments, they're like, OK, this is true. I'm going to become orthodox. I'd say on a very small minority, like there's a small minority of the people <coughs> who like will will hate orthodoxy um, and say, oh, that's idol that's idolatrous. That's bad. Um, the other big, big kind of sect is. The ecumenists where it's like oh we're you know we're all christians you know i'm fine with the orthodox but i think that most people who are kind of interested in the truth who wants like the most solid faith and are taking their faith seriously if you bring orthodoxy up to them in a good in a good light at the right time and you're not just like commanding commanding them and you 
are very fair with them and they like come to church, I think, you know, it will win over their heart. Cause it's like just going to the divine liturgy. Like, it's just like this, this is holy. Like that holiness they're going to feel like if, if, if they go there um, and not only like the holiness, but when you read our theology in comparison to all the other, you know, theology, it doesn't, you know, fall into these, these errors and to fall into these heresies. Like it's actually logically consistent. So mm -hmm. it is, it is, there's a lot of internal uh, consistency in orthodoxy. And I, and I agree with what you said. A lot of it is um, being able to uh, exemplify the faith to, to live it, um, to be able to, to positive, uh, positively uh, portray it. And a lot of the time, the, the inverse that some people struggle with is when they get excited, they, mm -hmm. they sometimes get too quick to want to pick fights, to, yeah. to want to go out there, fight everyone, <laughs> fight with their yeah. family. I've, I've seen cases where husbands and wives have fought over it and where, um, you know, or sons have fought with their dads and <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, exactly. it's going to be inevitable a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a little bit of kind of back and forth when I was first converting, I, I know I had to navigate things with my family, but not too much. You know, my dad was raised Orthodox and just sim simply returned from being an apostasy. Um, and my mom converted with him wow. um, along with my sister and my brother-in-law, who uh, some of you would have seen on the last live stream I did um, father, John Castillo. Um, but the, uh, I guess the question I have for you, Kyle, is how, how would you recommend people, especially young people who are wanting to convert to the faith? Cause I get these questions a lot. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of people saying, you know, I'm 16, I'm 17, I'm 18, yeah. or I'm still living with my parents. They're not okay with me becoming Orthodox. What do I do? Yeah. Uh, or sometimes they allow for their kids to go to church and convert, but the parents are kind of remaining in their own way of doing things. What is, is a way you would recommend that they navigate this? And, and what are some things that they can do if they're unable to go to church until they're on their own? Yeah, I, I think these are very tough questions. And it's, it's a, I mean, it's a good problem to have that all these people want to become Orthodox, but there's these other factors um, getting in the way. And like, it's, it's really tough. Like, I haven't gone through that as like having a kind of hostile household. But I think through <coughs> reading the lives of the saints, people can find people that they connect with that have gone through similar experiences and seeing how they navigated through this. Because it's like, you know, this problem actually isn't new. It's like there was lots of people living in pagan households who like wanted to become Christian in their in the early centuries. And that was like life or death. And so what did they do? They obviously prayed. They tried to fast in whatever way they could. This doesn't always mean uh, food. Again, the, the fast is, is is a tool for us to, to, to grow closer to God. So, I mean, even yeah. if it's like a, a, TV, a TV fast, uh, a video a video game fast, um, these are lots of good things that you can do at, at your house if you don't have access to a church, if your parents don't let you. Um, saying, saying the Jesus prayer every night, if you're able to get a prayer book and just, if you're able to do the morning prayers and the night prayers, that that's a lot. I mean, that, that, that's good. It's about building a sustainable faith. If you can build a sustainable faith when you're in a hostile household, then when you get out, when you, you know, are, go to college or out on, out on your own, then you're really going to be able to really grow in, grow in your faith. So yes. um, just like see, see the light at the end of the tunnel that, you know, th this is, this is your cross to bear right now. Um, I don't think you should get in, don't get into arguments with your parents just because it, it's, it's not, it's not going to, it's just going to make it worse. It's just going to make them more closed minded unless, unless your parents are like open-minded and, um, and willing or, to have like, yeah, if they're asking questions yeah. and you know, then yeah, definitely make sure you're ready to answer those questions and, but you know, yeah. to be patient and not expect them to get it right away either. You know? yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you don't, like don't go to your parents and say you know you're you're wrong and I I'm, I'm becoming orthodox today. It's like um, just just bring it to them. Or your mother like, and father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to bring it to them like it's something positive. Like, hey, mom, dad, I'm I started looking into like kind of church history. I'm looking into this thing called like Orthodox Christianity. I mean, I think that's very like it would be irrational for them to be upset. Like you're not saying anything to them you're just sharing something positive with um 
about your life. But again, you need like you need to know your parents enough because the sad thing is is that a lot of parents act like children and a lot of parents are very insecure. Like yeah. if if they see their child has done like all this research, they may have some projection and say, "Oh, you you can't you can't do that. You have to go to my church." So yeah, because parents, you know, and speaking as a parent myself, you you, you get kind of tender when it comes to your kids, and yeah, you, you know, I think where it comes from. To be fair to some of these to these parents who are resistant, I think where a lot of this comes from is them feeling like they've somehow uh, failed or are inadequate in terms of what they've taught you and presented to you. And that's it's very hard because as a parent, at the end, for us, this is all we're going to have is what we teach our kids. Uh, in terms of the impact we have on our life. If it's one thing I know that I want to pass on to my son, it's it's a solid sense of what is important with family values. He's, I don't know if anyone can hear, he's screaming his head off because <laughs> my, my wife, Matashana, is putting him to bed and he's not happy about uh, having to go to bed. <laughs> he's got a good set of lungs. Um, but one thing I, I want to pass on to him more than anything, of course, is my faith. And so for parents yeah. who have not maybe been exposed to anything other than Protestantism. I mean, there was a uh, huge uh, quote unquote revivals in the eighties and nineties where people um, had uh, converted on mass to Protestantism, but then it, it kind of peters out because a lot of the time it, it's very, it's very worldly. It's my father had said for him, his struggle with it and seeing uh, Protestantism is that a lot of the time in his experience, uh, he said it was almost like people wanted to still be in the world. They wanted to have their cake and eat it too. And they yeah. treat Christianity like an insurance plan for your soul. So yeah. that actually leads me to another question I wanted to ask you, Kyle. Mm-hmm. Um, what, how would you respond when Protestants try to engage in the polemic of if you die tonight, do you know where you're going to end up? And uh, you know, how would you maybe put people at ease uh, when it comes to uh, them obtaining salvation, when it when it comes to accepting the process, yeah, that's uh, yeah, I've <laughs> I've had this question brought up a lot. Is you know, Protestants, uh, some of them have this doctrine that yeah, you can have one hundred percent assurance of your salvation, and when we read the Orthodox saints, we can see the most holy people, they did did not that they did not. They said I I still need time to repent. Uh, I'm first among sinners. Like I literally haven't even begun to to repent. Um, and so it, it, it can be scary that, you know, this like hell, (coughs) this idea of hell, but when you understand, you know, what heaven and hell is that, you know, you're going to be in the presence of God and it's just really how you love God in, in this life, how you depended on God. I mean, if you're completely in, like, if you're doing your prayers and you, Yes, we're going to fall, but it's about how many times you get up, you get up again and really depend on God and your that closeness to God. If, if you're close to God, then his love is, is going to feel good. It's, it's going to feel heavenly because hell is just the bad experience of God, of, of rejecting um, his love. So, yes. so we can't, we can't <clears throat> dis- despair because we need to, you know, tr- trust in Christ. You know, Christ, Christ did die for us, this, this ultimate sacrifice uh, on the cross. And we're trying to, it's like we've been given such a great gift. And it's just, we want to give so much back to God and live a life that glorifies him and that we can have that relationship with him. That's all, that's all God wants is that relationship with us. And so if you have that relationship with God and you're doing your prayers and you're just being honest you know, in, in confession, which, which is really, which is really hard to be honest in confession. Yeah. Especially when you, when you keep falling into the same sins again and again, but it's, it's about getting up again. And it's not, it's not about the past. It's about, do you have that, you know, true repentance in, in that moment? And it, even if you've lived a life full of sin, if you have that, you know, that true repentance and you're truly <coughs> sorry, if you really hate that sin, then of course, God, God is going to accept you, is going to accept you. That's, that's, that's all he wants. And that's why, you know, the story of the, of the prodigal son is, is so amazing is, you know, the prodigal son came back and the father welcomed him back in open arms, despite he, 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 like, you know, the earthly logic 
would say, you know, the other son did, 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 you know, did good, did better because he, he, he never, he never left, but the prodigal son came back with that, you know, that true repentance. Yeah. He was willing to eat the food of the servants and to just be a servant. Exactly. So I just be honest with yourself, be honest with your sins. Um, I think if, I think, I think you should, if you have a conscious for, I need to improve that I am a sinner, then you're probably doing, doing good. That means you're, you're close to God. Because if you think that, you know, that, oh, I don't have any sins, then you're, then you probably are far away from, from God. And it, this doesn't, and we don't want to conflate this either with like depression or like, you need to like constantly be beating down on yourself. Like you should, it's like knowing, like it's, it's good that we have this room to improve. Like this room to improve is not something bad. It's like, don't you want to be a better version of yourself versus if you just had no standard at all and God just, you know, accepted us as, as whatever that, that wouldn't do any good to us. So, you know, don't, don't despair, even though, you know, that standard is high. It's just like that standard is going to, is going to help you. It's going to, it's going to help you in your faith. It's going to help you in every aspect of your life to just shoot for the, the, the highest. Well said, well said, you know, it's, it's nice to, to know that we have that room to improve, like you said, and, and that, uh, ultimately, you know, the whole of our life, uh, you know, because people will ask me, oh, Father, I'm, I'm worried about the salvation of my soul. And I always try to tell them that as long as you draw breath, you have a chance to repent. Exactly. You always have a chance to, to say, you know, that, that Lord have mercy. You always have a chance to do your prayers. And, you know, I think one of the most important things for developing the mind and the heart of Christ is maintaining a consistent prayer life. You know, it yeah. doesn't have to be complex. Um, it can be as simple as your morning and your evening prayers to start and, and your before and after meals. But of course, you need the right tools for that. Uh, what is your favorite prayer book to use, Kyle? So I just use the Jordan Vale prayer book. I think it's the, it's one of the most common standard. ones. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's it's <coughs> great. The prayers in it are so deep. They're beautiful. Um, yeah, and I I like having it every night, even if you just read one from it, and then you can just also pr- you know pray from the heart after. Like it's not like you have to do like one or the other. Like the, the great thing about orthodoxy is you can, you can do both, but yeah, you, know, you don't have to be mechanical. Exactly. And, and we don't, and we don't want to be mechanical. I mean, the, the best thing you can do is to have like a really, really sincere prayer where you're fully thinking about God versus like mind, mindless prayers. And like yes. our goal is to get to that point where all of our prayers are meaningful and from the heart and that's really difficult because we have so many distractions in our brain, like thinking, you know, in prayer, thinking about like, well, um, th- what what we ate for dinner that night, what what's going on the next day. But prayer prayer should be something. <clears throat> it shouldn't be a, feel like a chore. It should be. It should feel like something great. Like this is my time. Um, yeah, it, time it should be like a, a time of refuge and, and solace. Exactly. Right? Yes. Yeah, that's that's what I find, and, and I'm I'm also a big time fan of the Jordanville prayer book, <laughs> but it was my first one and I've stuck with it this, this whole time. Yeah. And occasionally, you know, I, I enjoy the, um, the, the prayers out of the old, right. Uh, Russian Orthodox prayer book put out by the Erie parish, um, which are, they're in communion with Rokor there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they, they practice the old, uh, Russian Orthodox, right. And I'm going to be trying to uh, get a hold of a priest to come on here sometime and, and talk about that. <laughs> just, cool. just to kind of get the, you know, a little bit more into some interesting topics that way. But uh, yeah, the, with with the prayer books, you know, I, I find that sometimes what I like to do is just recommend people to uh, to start with select prayers and then just to add them on with time. You don't have to do the whole thing. You, you know, like the morning prayers, I think of the Jordanville prayer book are about 30 pages long. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, if, you're, if you're starting, don't feel like you have to. Just <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jump into it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> right. Yeah, we don't want we don't want to just like you don't want to burn yourself out. That's that's yeah. another very important like advice especially when you're new is you don't want to like go super hard at the beginning and then you just stop. Like I see, I see that, that a lot with like Muslim converts. They just like take their, their oh yeah, their, like they get right into the, the daily <laughs> yeah. hour like, yeah. according to when they're supposed to pray. And yeah, they just, <laughs> there's like, they just take their Shahada. I'm Muslim now. They try <coughs> to do all the prayers. They, they get burnt out and then they're on to the next thing after versus like orthodoxy we've got the like catechism classes which are very long it's like are you sure you want to join the orthodox church 
you know, this, this is what we believe. Like, do you want to be Orthodox Christian? Because it should really, it should be as serious as like a commitment as like marriage, like, you know, becoming an Orthodox yeah. Christian. And so yeah. it's, it's not necessarily really going to Christ. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you don't need to be perfect to, to join. I mean, it's, it's the hospital for sinners, but it's just like, are you <laughs> willing to continue to grow in your faith? Do you want to, you know, stay, stay on this path? You're going to fall a lot. And it's just, are you going to, are you going to be able to sustain, sustain this, sustain this yeah. for your life is the goal. Absolutely. It's, it's a lifestyle too. Right. And, and yeah, prayer is, you know, it's like um, St. Ignatius, uh, Brian Cheninoff wrote in uh, one of my favorite books that I, I'm going to start probably doing more catechetical talks from is, is The Field by St. Ignatius, Brian Cheninoff. And because uh, I've re been revisiting it lately, uh, especially throughout Lent, I like to you know have a few things going like a, a you know book that's like spiritual counsels or homilies or teachings from different uh, fathers. And uh, and of course, you know, it's always good to be reading the lives of saints. And one thing I, I love that he wrote and on prayer was that when we're approaching prayer, we should have a disposition that is reflective of what we're praying for. And, uh, and of course, a disposition that, you know, shows forth humility before God, you know, to, to yeah. as he put it, to bow your head, you know, as you stand there like a prisoner, you know, even with your, your hands behind your back, because you're, you're not yeah. approaching an equal, you're, you're approaching the king and the righteous judge. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, and, you know, to, to even have your appearance be neat and tidy, uh, when approaching God in prayer, because you, you don't want to just treat it nonchalantly. Totally. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's important to have a good disposition. Mm -hmm. so, wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, Kyle. That was, that was great. Um, uh, before we, we maybe get to a couple questions and then wrap it up so that we're not too late. So we're, you know, <laughs> we both want to go to, go to sleep at a, at a reasonable hour. <laughs> um, that one live stream I did with my brother-in-law that was four hours long. That was kind of uh, <laughs> unexpected and won't be the case tonight. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, but what, what, where can people get in contact with you? Uh, do you have a discord? Do you have a, well, I, I know you do, but <laughs> for the sake of the video, um, yeah. the discord, you know, social media is kind of places where people can reach and interact with your work. Yeah. So you can find me on YouTube, Kyle Orthodox. <laughs> Um, Orthocast on YouTube, um, Dire Clips. If you want to reach out to me, I try to respond to every single email, every single message on Instagram or Twitter. So if you have any questions, reach out to me and I'll, I'll probably respond. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and you, you have a Discord, right? Or Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and the Discord <coughs> where you've been teaching some, um, some Q&A classes, if you guys have any um, questions for father. Yeah, I do. I do a Q and a on there once every Wednesday, um, just for about an hour around that time, just to try and help out and just answer some questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, great people on that discord and you got a lot of good apologists, like our, our good friend Ephraim. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yeah, he's, he's a, a tireless, uh, worker for, for helping others. So, you know, and I, and it's good to get in touch with other Orthodox Christians and, and just kind of, um, have that experience of connecting with them. But of course, the number one thing is always to find a parish. Yeah. Um, so with that said, I don't really have any more questions. Was there anything you'd like to kind of end off with before we answer a couple questions and then wrap it up? Um, no, not really. I think, I think I covered everything. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Kyle. It was a yeah. really enjoyable conversation and uh, very profitable. I, I think for many people here, um, just uh, thanks to one of our viewers there's there's Kyle's channel in case any of you are not familiar with his work go and check him out he's got a, a lot of good videos on there he even has playlists uh yeah. if you're someone who's coming from atheism or protestantism or catholicism and uh I've I've sent some of these playlists to people and, and they found them helpful so if you've got some questions and you're wanting to see the orthodox response to some things go check those out um so we'll get to some questions um so I'll let you answer this one Kyle I think it's a Easy one for you to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Are Orthodox another branch of Amish and Mennonites? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think the, the Amish and Mennonites are actually like, uh, and Baptists, like there's some weird sect from the radical reformation <laughs> and the modern day, the like Southern Baptists, I think are like three removed from, from, from the, 
Amish and Mennonites, some, something like that. But yeah. uh, no, no, no. We we reject the filioque, and some of those those mentioned groups actually accept it, um, yeah. along with other things that that we Orthodox don't agree on, such as sola scriptura and yeah. other things like that. You know, the Bible is very important. You should be reading it, but mm -hmm. it is not the sole source of authority. Yeah, it doesn't stand on its own. Um, good, good answer. Uh, we got a, a a super chat. Also, all super chats will be shared <laughs> with uh, with my with my uh, co-host on here with Kyle. So uh, I'll be splitting all the super chats with him. Uh, our good friend Chase Haggard uh, apparently wants to help you finish your your beard implant. <laughs> mine mine went pretty well. So uh, thanks to everyone. Okay. <laughs> okay uh, Oh, don't blame you being a big meaning on your genetics. Desert Fox is a is a moderator in one of my in my uh, Living Orthodox Discord. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, let's see. Okay, I would like to become a nun, God willing, after my mother passes. Do you know how to do this? Please, thank you. So I'll I'll answer this one. Um, one of the best things you can do first off is is to pray uh, really really hard on this, and the next is to to make the time to go and visit monasteries, in particular uh, women's convents and uh you know maybe go for a few days to start and then you know go and, and spend a week there maybe offer to help out and to do some obediences with the nuns uh kyle have you ever been to a monastery uh yes i've actually been to a woman's mon monastery a greek one oh very good very good, very good. Yeah. which one do you mind me asking uh the it's life-giving spring in dunlap okay. uh it's in like uh like central california Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've I've only been to Jordanville, but it it was a blast. So <laughs> it was <laughs> yeah. a blast there. It's uh the, the you know and, and the, the the monastery churches are just so beautiful. You know, yeah, just they are. Icons. Um, but you know, I, I'm always encouraging a people to you know when they are interested in monasticism to really yeah to really pray hard about it to look into it. Yeah. Um, you know, don't give up on it. <laughs> Actually, I I know I just did an interview with um. This this lady named Christina Orthocast thirty three and she has a YouTube channel called like Building Orthodox Family Life and I'm sure you can um, I think she has her email in her YouTube channel but she talks to a lot of um, like uh, like not like nuns because she lived very close to a monastery so maybe maybe she'd be a good resource if you're interested mm. in that yeah and maybe I can reach out and have her on here at some point too yeah uh, sure. yeah good to to promote that right yeah. Okay, so then we got uh, Ruby Quinn who asked, question, does it matter which ethnic church you attend? I'm not from Ukraine, but the church is named Ukrainian. I heard of an American one, but I don't know if that matters. Well, we, we have both answered this. Uh, why don't you take uh, the first crack at it, Kyle? Yeah, so there's actually a great website called uh, Orth <laughs> Orthodoxy in America, and you can just search up your city and uh, it will like show all the churches. But on this on this specific question... Uh, yes, you can attend any church. That's just going back to like where the patriarch is. But there is a canonical and non-canonical Ukrainian church. So that's why I say make sure it's not <coughs> orthodoxy in America because they'll make sure that's a canonical uh, Ukrainian church. But yeah, all all ethnicities can go to any church because it's the same church, the Eastern Orthodox Church. Exactly. Like the, the church I serve in is the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. And uh, my parish, though, is actually a English speaking parish. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, there's a couple things here and there that I'll do in church Slavonic because we do have some some Russians, some some uh, Slavs who attend the parish. But uh, we primarily serve in English. And yeah. as you can tell, I don't have an accent. I was born and raised in Canada. So yeah. while I do, I guess some, some Americans would say I have a Canadian accent. But uh, yeah. yeah, so, you know, orthodoxy isn't isn't about where you're from. Um, and as Kyle said, there is a, a non-canonical Ukrainian church. Be, be cautious. Here in Canada, most uh, Ukrainian Orthodox churches, unfortunately, do support and are involved with uh, or have even helped to start the schismatic uh, non-canonical church in Ukraine, which unfortunately has, has been involved with the persecution of canonical Ukrainian Christians. So pray for them. Don't, don't hate on them, but pray for them. Pray <laughs> that God would yeah. illumine them and that you know they would become true members of the church and that we wouldn't have all these canonical uh, parallel jurisdictions where there's a strife. So, yeah. And, uh, but the Orthodox church in America, the OCA, uh, which I think is probably going to be the most common one you'll find in the States. 
Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're a good jurisdiction too. They're canonical. Um, they have their roots in Russian Orthodoxy, which you can tell from the vestments and the, the hymnography, but most of their parishes will be in English. Yeah. Okay. Um, one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Thank you for the super chat, uh, G26. Um, so Father, what would you say about a person that is an Orthodox Christian and doesn't really know nothing, but they love the traditions of the Western Church and the Roman Catholics? Well, uh, this we'll, we'll both answer this one, I think, because mm-hmm. you know, Kyle had spent some time as a Roman Catholic as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I get it. You know, I get the, the desire to kind of have this connection to uh, Western roots and to kind of reclaim... Uh, this idea of westernness uh, but the problem is is that most of the the traditions of the catholic church are post schism innovations and so there are western right orthodox churches but a lot of them have had a hard time um, doing it right i've seen one online i can't remember the name of the priest of the church i would know it to see it it's it's been on on i think it's just called orthodox christianity on yeah. that channel um <clears throat> and you know it, when it's done right it's beautiful it's it's good um, but a lot of the time they will allow for innovations like the Immaculate and Sacred Hearts, mm-hmm. uh, which we reject. Um, you know, a lot of the time they'll engage in post schism devotions, which are uh, ultimately, even though they might seem benign on the surface, you have to remember that the spirit of delusion is what undergirds this. Yeah. That, uh, you know, you can't, um, you know, just put a drop of poison in the milk and think that you can salvage the milk for the poison. You know, it's, it's in there. So yeah, you have to be careful because especially if you're spiritually young or immature, you shouldn't even really be reading uh, anything by heretics just because it, it can it can confuse you. It can it can cause delusion to set in. And I've, I've seen that happen. Whereas, um, as St. Ignatius points out, once someone for the purpose of building up the church, such as getting into apologetics, uh, and they have the blessing to do this, and they're spiritually mature enough to not... Um, be folded by the writings of heretics then you know you can you can start using that for the sake of refuting them but it, it's important to to be careful not to necessarily hold the cultural expression up on a pedestal either mm-hmm. what, what would you like to say to that Kyle yeah yeah I would definitely say the same thing about uh western right and it's there, there's not that many western right parishes but I think Rocor actually has been doing it <coughs> Very well in some places but i'd say definitely give the eastern right a chance like me someone a westerner who loved the traditional latin mass when i went to the divine liturgy i i loved it even more it was just like to me it was i, I just loved the entire eastern aesthetic aesthetic and and everything the the east the eastern chants like it was just especially the the slavic chants they um, just so deep and like they portrayed emotions that we don't often hear in Christianity, like just this sorrowfulness, but also like the hope, hope and joy. So I think if you go to a few different Orthodox churches, um, even if, though they're, they are, Eastern, <clears throat> you'll find one way where you feel at home. Glory to God. That was a good answer. Very good Thanks. answer. Um, let's see. Uh, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You suck. <laughs> Hold right. Enjoy your praise. Be God. Yeah. I've, I've always, had a soft spot for the old right. I've always loved it. If I ever had the opportunity to learn how to perform uh, the old right, I, I certainly would. I think it's a beautiful part of Russian heritage and, and Russian orthodoxy. It, it, it's a it's a very Christo uh, Christocentric liturgy. Um, there, there is a, it's still the liturgy of Saint John Chrysostom, but there are some differences in how it's executed. I'm just not, unfortunately, too well versed on that. I'm kind of more familiar with their prayer rule now with, for their morning and evening prayers, the the way they do their hours. Um, very beautiful. So. Uh, if anyone is wondering about it, you can check out, and if you're in the Erie, Pennsylvania area, check out the Church of the Nativity. Um, there's also another church um, outside of that area. If you're, I can't remember which part of, it's just about 40, 30, 40 minutes from Erie. It's another old right church, but that one's directly under the MP. However, that one is is run by a priest who I've, I've had a lot of wonderful interactions with by the name of Father Seraphim Wing. So if you've ever seen them on Facebook or, you know, you're looking for an old right church <laughs> and if you're in the Pennsylvania uh, area, especially near Erie, you'll find a couple of really cool old right parishes and they're actually doing really, really well. Um, they're seeing a lot of converts, which doesn't surprise me. A lot of a lot of people coming from more traditional Catholic kind of backgrounds like Kyle and myself did. Mm-hmm. We're, we're pretty drawn to the to the sober worship of the East. Father, <clears throat> uh, we're supposed to add. Uh, the selection for matins and our Sunday morning prayers uh, from Jordanville Prayer Book. No, um, if you're attending 
I mean, you can, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, but typically if you're attending uh, the, if you're in a roll court parish uh, such as mine and you attend the all night vigil, uh, you will get Vespers and Matins all at once. Um, you know, and if you're in the Southern Alberta area, come pay us a visit. <laughs> you know, we, we start at 5.30, so you'll, you'll get home at a decent time. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you, Slow Boy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I love the name, but uh, Slow Boy Whiteboard's uh, always been uh, pretty supportive on the channel. So thank you to her and her husband. Uh, any adv any advice for a young man courting a lady? You know what? As uh, you're, you've been kind of in that position recently, Kyle. I'll let you take the lead <laughs> on that one because I've been married. Yeah, no. <laughs> I would say you want to remain as sober as possible and not let anything superficial <laughs> blind you. Like you should, you need to be putting God first, and God may have put this person in your life, but you just want to make sure that you're not. Uh, you're not giving into like lust and that's why you like them because you're going to hurt their feelings and their feelings. Uh, be yourself, uh, look out for, you know, red flags in their behavior. Um, you know, everyone's got different preferences for me. I look for someone who's like uh, very, very positive. Um, they, 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 they help others. They're kind of more, more extroverted. Um, so, you know, the, make sure you know what you're looking for and you know treat her with respect um obviously i you know pay for things on dates i think that goes a long way um you know compliment her you know you know be, be a man in the relationship like you should you know take the take the initiative and like say like hey i i really like you and i'd like to get you to know you better like like something yeah. like that that will like mean a lot um 100%. and also <laughs> yeah. Um, and you can let, you know, when the time's right, you can let her know that, you know, you're not just dating for fun, you're dating for marriage and that you really, um, you, you really like her. I mean, I personally think the best way to, to really, um, uh, fight, you know, court someone is first, it's good to like, be their friend for a little bit and see like, are they a good friend? Like, see how they treat their friends. If they're a really good friend and you see that they, then I think that's going to translate into like a good relationship. Like if they value you as a friend, then they're really going to value you as a, a partner. And obviously don't simp. I think that's one of the, the worst things is you don't want to be so infatuated or like, even if you really like the person, you still want to, you know, not go against, you want to like, you you don't want to just be a, a pushover because it's gonna it's gonna be bad for you, and it's gonna um, make them less attracted to you. So like, you know you know be be firm, don't be a simp, be be confident. I mean, don't be desperate. Don't yes, don't don't be desperate. It's desperation is the biggest turnoff. Um, I think desperation is directly related to simpitis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I think there may be a, a, there's a comor uh, comorbidity there. <laughs> yeah. That's that's good advice. Is there anything else you'd like to kind of add on to that? Because this is a a pretty big one for a lot of young men out there. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to make a whole video on that on that someday. But yeah. it's it's a very it's a very important topic. Uh, make yes. sure you like are hygienic and are like taking showers and and smell good, and um, like like just be socially conscious like i don't i don't know just be be normal be normal uh don't try too be, hard yeah don't 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 try too hard be okay with rejection um i mean that's how you have to <laughs> succeed in life is you can't be so desperate that you're that you're scared you're going to lose it because then you are going to lose it um and so yeah just if you do get rejected just embrace that and move on and say you know th again you know, falling down and getting back up again. It's a, it's a learning process. And and for single men, and I mean, this is also for men who are engaged or married, but especially one piece of advice I'd love to give to a lot of single guys out there is make sure you get rid of all your bad habits. You know, exactly. Stop going to sin.com, you know, um, yeah. be sober, be sober and and make sure that you have a good schedule that you're keeping a routine that you're taking care of yourself and that you're not just wasting hours in front of the tv yeah you know make sure you're you're doing things to 
be proactive and to, to build up your life to be, um, you know, financially viable. Very important. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. One last thing is I think you should um, pray pray before dates. I think that's something very good to do, very, very authentic. And that will kind of <laughs> set the tone for your relationship. Like if you're putting God first in these kind of like early, early um, dates, like, hey, can we just, you know, pray before we go on this date? I think it will, I mean, it, it will, it will help. Absolutely. Fantastic advice, Kyle. Um, I think that that'll help a lot of uh, people. Um, your vid on COLG. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> help me see through anti COLG cold lies. Uh, Someone help me understand this. <laughs> um, uh, well, I'm glad it was helpful. Um, yeah. I'm glad it was helpful. Uh, next one is <laughs> he's one of my parishioners. <laughs> oh, that's a trick question, Constantine. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> we priests aren't supposed to have favorites, but just know that I love all of you, and I'm I'm very grateful to have the parishioners I have. <laughs> he's he's one of my guys. <laughs> hope you and hope you and the wife are doing well tonight. Uh, keep uh, keep uh, Mitch Murphy in your prayers, guys. He's going to be a dad real soon. Um, you know, pray for him and his wonderful wife, Helen, they're, they're expecting their first baby, uh, in May after, after Pascha. So, uh, wow. what a, what a blessed time. So keep them in your prayers, keep praying for them. Uh, let's see, we got one from Bruce Roberts. Well, thank you. God bless you too. You. We're, you know, we're just glad that this is helping people come to the church and coming to Christ. You know, that's what it's all about. Okay. We got one from Antonio. And he, he says, Christ bless Father and Kyle. Everything that you both do is a true blessing. Truly amazing to see such an explosive growth in holy orthodoxy. Nothing compared to how it was in 2007 when I embraced it. Jesus Christos Nika. Well, God bless you, Constantine. Thank you. Uh, Antonio. <laughs> and Constantine as well. But God bless you, Antonio. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're happy to, uh, to just be of service. Uh, we've got a super chat. Thank you. So like I said, all super chats will be split with Kyle. Um, so we'll, you know, this, this goes to supporting both, uh, both groups. So thank you so much. Um, let's see. So we have, uh, I think one more, one or two more questions that I, I caught here. Um, ah, yes, excuse me. I'm somewhat new to the Orthodox faith. I got a good understanding, but how can I biblically explain orthodoxy and traditions to my devout non-denominational parents, uh, Pro Protestant parents? Kyle, why don't you, uh. Why don't you take that one? Yeah. So like I said earlier, I would definitely, before you discuss these, like definitely just kind of think about your parents' maturity. Like, are they open-minded? Are they going to get mad about this? If, if they are open-minded, you can just explain that you're looking into orthodoxy and, <clears throat> you know, going back in church history, like looking at the very beginning, you know, Christ established a church and he promised that church would, you know, never defect. And, you know, in a book like, the religion of the apostles, it will give you basically all the evidence you need and show um, that all the kind of practices that orthodoxy <coughs> has today, we're doing the same uh, traditions as the apostles because it's just been handed down from them, uh, which we got, which we got from Christ. And also, you know, the book Rock and Sand that I showed earlier is a good analysis that basically you know, your non-denominational parents, you know, orthodoxy isn't really a denomination because it's kind of like pre-denominational because all these denominations really came from the Protestant Reformation. So basically start at the beginning and you could see, you know, Christ established a church and there's like these like little schisms until the, the big schism, 1054, you know, East and West split. <clears throat> and, you know, the West is the, the Catholic Church. And then, you know, 500 years later, we get the Protestant Reformation. We get all these different uh, denominations. They're just trying to reform the church at first, but it's basically founded by a lot of individuals like Lutheranism, started by Martin Luther. Um, and then these denominations come to America, and then eventually people say, you know, actually denominations aren't that important. And so that's how that non-denominational thing started. But non-denominational churches have a lot of the same beliefs as the, from the radical reformation. Like they don't have the liturgy. They don't have the priesthood. They don't have uh, any of the sacraments uh, except uh, kind of a loose baptism, maybe a loose Eucharist um, where you're just like eating a cracker and some grape juice. 
So um, <clears throat> biblically, if you want to explain orthodoxy, you can show about the real presence in the Eucharist. Um, if you just search, you know, biblical evidence for the Eucharist, you can find lots of verses about the Eucharist. And to back that up, you could also look up church fathers on the Eucharist and see that, oh, these people in the very early church, they didn't believe that this was just like a symbol that you you eat as everyone gives you some random cracker and grape juice. They believed this was like really the flesh and blood of Christ um, to the Eucharist. Um, also, how they're how they're worshiping in the Old Testament and how we read about in Acts and, and the priesthood and all of that. So um, I think if you check out my Protestant playlist, it will uh give you some ideas of, of how to explain that. But again, just, you know, be careful when discussing with your parents. <coughs> Absolutely. I oh, just got a couple more to go through and then we'll, we'll call it a night. Um, do you think online apologetics can be an impediment to cultivating a spiritual life and does more harm than good for the majority of new converts? What, what would, would you like to answer that one, Kyle? So I definitely believe it can be an impediment for cultivating a spiritual life because instead of like praying, you're just watching apologetics videos and you're just kind of like getting mad at people online. Yeah. If but the question the morning and evening prayers, there might be a problem. Yeah, exactly. So does it do more harm than good for the majority? I think it does more good, but I think it's all about finding that, that balance. Like you should, that's why really the online apologetics is just like, the start, like you found out about orthodoxy and, but really like I've talked about throughout the stream, like go to your church, get involved, go to Vespers, do the prayers every day. Like you should be so busy with living the faith that you don't have time to watch random debates and, and these things. Um, I think you're, you're going to people are, you're going to be much happier. You're going to go much closer to God by not being online, like just in general, not even just like, watching apologetics. But, um, I mean, if I wasn't on a YouTuber, I would, I would probably, I wouldn't spend that like any time on YouTube. I would just be spending time, uh, in my, in my life, uh, like with the, with the people I care about. So if you don't have a YouTube channel, that's what you should be doing, um, is get like focusing on your spiritual life, helping your local church grow. Um, it can even be things like, like I talked about earlier, like starting a book club at your church, uh, maybe getting together and say, hey, like we should do some hikes together with some, with some people like um, at, at your church and maybe contacting other churches and kind of building like a, you know, pan-Orthodox network in your local city. I mean, this is going to make much bigger impact on your life if you have all these close friends. Maybe you could meet your significant other this way versus just like knowing about these random apologetic arguments. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, they're, they're beneficial to an extent, but... Yeah. Don't lose uh, don't lose sight of what's most important. That's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, David. That's you you caught on to it. Born and raised in southern Ontario. <laughs> uh question, your opinion on Orthodox Meme Squad you, uh, YouTube channel. I you know, I like them. They got some good playlists on there. <laughs> some good yeah. chance. Uh I was I was on um their um their podcast channel once. Mm -hmm. A great bunch of guys. Uh what about you, Kyle? You you like uh you like their their chants? <laughs> yeah, no, I love the the chant playlist he puts together. He puts in so much work making a lot of these, um, you know, silly silly memes. And I think they've gotten you know better over over time. Uh, I've I've interviewed him, hearing his story, and I went on his uh, podcast channel too. But yeah, I think he does lots of great work because you know, there's lots of people like kind of in the world where these memes are the things that reach him. You know, the first interest in orthodoxy. So yeah, check him out. I I think he's good. Yeah. I think he's really good. Um, and I've had a chance to talk to Dimitri as well. He's a great guy. Yeah. Um, uh, how do we feel about Pope John Paul II? Well, uh, he's not Orthodox. Uh, we don't acknowledge him as a saint. Um, and he did some pretty heretical things. Yeah. <laughs> Kissing the Quran is uh, a big no-no. I think I think one of your videos on Catholicism, you have like a, a shot of him kissing the Quran. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was... The reason I show that so often is because that's like one of the things that made me really see there's a problem in Catholicism is it's not just like John Paul II. It wasn't just like he kissed the Quran once <coughs> throughout his homilies. He he praises Islam. He asked uh, St. John the Baptist to, to praise Islam um, in one of his, his speeches. He And it wasn't just Islam. It was with Hinduism, with every religion you could think of. Yeah, like he, that. Uh, the CC thing he did. Yes. 
and yeah, yeah uh, the the CC one and the CC two, and it's just like how could he do something so like contrary <clears throat> to Christianity? Like not, he just the complete relativism of of these religions, acting like they're all the same, and it's he's the Pope, the like supreme teacher of all Christians, and he's a Catholic saint. I mean, to me, it just didn't make any sense. I mean, like, may the Lord have mercy on his soul, but it's just like, I, the, it was shocking. Um, he received Zapotec witch blessings. I mean, it was just, yeah, it's syncretism. And it's, it's sad. It's so it sad. Uh, what are your thoughts on Catholic Eucharistic miracles? You want to, you want to stab at that one, Kyle? I, I think everyone here will know what, what my take is. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't know about these. I mean, just because like something miraculous happens, we, we don't know if it's from God or not. I mean, I, we really, we don't know. Um, but to, to, to base your faith on this kind of like signs and wonders is not a good way to, 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 base, our, to base our faith. No, um, we even see in, in Exodus, the, the priests of the Egyptian gods who were the servants of the devil, they were able to perform similar signs and miracles. It's, exactly. There's, of course, a difference. God has the ability to create. He has the ability to do things. But the devil can can move things materially. He can make things appear a certain way. Um, and, of course, because we're not in communion with them, you know, we, we believe that they are cut off from the body of Christ and that they are, you know, they don't have uh, grace. So we as Orthodox uh, on a canonical level do not accept these things. Um, instead, we, we pray that they will eventually overcome their confusion and return to the church. But um yeah it's like kyle said don't get caught up in signs and wonders it's very dangerous too um <clears throat> what is the old right real simply peter uh great question by the way thanks thanks for the, the questions and thank you for saying good night to john in russian <laughs> thank you yeah. um so what is the old right uh, the old right is describing the pre niconian uh russian orthodox liturgical tradition uh that was in effect until around the 1600s uh which uh you know was really there's a lot tied to the time of troubles and everything else i'm going to do a, a stream in the future on this where we'll get into the history because it's a rather complicated thing but they're not the same necessarily as just old believers there's a difference between id uh, and um and between the um you know the the actual uh what we would call um you know priestless old ritualist so they're, they're old right russian orthodox who basically just think they're holding out until the end of the world they kind of Fallen into you know, what you'll see with some Protestant sects, um, and they don't have priests. They won't accept having priests. And then there are others who have come back into communion, um, and you know, people like uh, the Church of the, the, the Nativity in Erie. Uh, they're with Rocor, and there are other old right parishes that are now in communion with the Moscow Patriarchate. So, <clears throat> if you're going to check out an old right church, make sure they're not Primorian, and make sure that they're not schismatic. Um, make sure they're they're just in there. And uh, yeah, so I think um, this is the last one for tonight from Constantine, uh, from Constantine White. Potentially compli uh, complicated question. How does the split between the MP and Constantinople affect me as a layman? It's a good question. You want to answer this one? And I'll, I'll, I'll throw in on it too. But. Yeah, I would just say, like, don't obsess about these issues. But it, it is good to be aware of these, like, going into the future. There's been lots of confusing times in church history. Um, you know, it's sad what's happening with the patriarch in Constantinople. But I would say, you know, go to the church that's going to help you grow the most in the faith. Like even if something, you know, with with a split, if something you know, <clears throat> weird weird happens, um, there there's been faithful. Like there's faithful, ama amazing Greek priests. But I would say just just be. Just be just be on on watch of of, of issues like this, um, and if you I mean if you have the option maybe look for uh, a, a church that wouldn't like a Serbian OCA Russian church Antiochian church, um, but yeah just pray on it don't don't obsess about it. Absolutely, yeah and, and yeah don't don't obsess over it. Um, there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing that I can do about it other than, you know, pray that the matter will be resolved. Pray that, you know, certain things in 2025 don't go down the way they're, they're looking like they're going to go down. And, and I know um, priests from St. Anthony's Monastery and a few other Greek priests who are prepared to jump ship if they have to, because they're, they're not going to 
obviously remain if, if the AP goes into into union with the with the Pope. Yeah. Um, at that point, yeah, avoid avoid it. But uh, you know, in, in terms of the MP EP split, uh, split, I've never in my experience seen um, people from the the Greek Archdiocese of Canada be denied communion in uh, Rocour parishes. Um, we don't really level that on the layman. It's it's something where my bishop just makes it clear that we're not supposed to concelebrate, that we're not supposed to engage uh, with them on a liturgical level as priest. But that, you know, if, for example, if a lay person's traveling and they want to go to church and that's the only place where they can go, then, or if they've moved and that's the only thing in their city at the time, then you go receive Christ. You know, go, go for Christ, don't go for anything else. So, <clears throat> all right. Well, that's all for, for tonight, guys. Uh, sorry we couldn't get to every single question. Uh, we'd be here <laughs> probably for <laughs> another three hours um, if we did. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much to, to everyone who, who joined us for tonight. Thank you for the super chats. Uh, again, they'll be split between Kyle and myself. Um, and, uh, you know, be sure to go and subscribe to his channel if you haven't already. Um, he also has a good channel called Orthocast where he does a lot of interviews. Um, one that was pretty helpful for me here in Southern Alberta was your one with, uh, regarding uh, ex Mormons and, and Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, and <laughs> you know, there's something for everyone there. I really, uh, yeah. really enjoy it. So go check out Orthocast. You'll see a lot of good conversations on there and it, it might, uh, you might find something there that'll help you on your journey. Um, yeah. Be sure to also check out his Discord. I also have a Discord. I'll be including the links to both uh, later on um, in the description on here, probably tomorrow, as well as uh, I will be providing links to the books that Kyle uh, mm -hmm. shared and recommended. And please be sure to check them out and uh, you know, and, and avoid purchasing on Amazon if, if possible. And if, if not, well, you know, just I hope you benefit from the books. Hope you, <laughs> you benefit from this chat. So thank you, everyone. God bless you all. Have a wonderful night. Uh, thank you for joining us, Kyle, and uh, we'll hope to have you back on here at some point. Yeah, totally. Anytime. All right. Thank you. God bless you all. Good night. Okay.